Welcome to the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast, episode number 146. Hi, I'm Jill. Thank you for joining us today. And I'm Chris. Jill and I are your hosts for this podcast and the founders of the Becoming Ellie community. We decided to name our community Becoming Ellie because Ellie was the Norse goddess of aging who beat Thor in a wrestling match. Chris and I thought, we want to be like Ellie. (laughs) Yes, that's right. You can find out more about the Becoming Ellie community and this podcast at our website, becomingellie.com. And Ellie is spelled E-L-L-I. If you do go to the website, you might notice a new way to support the podcast. It's called Buy Me a Coffee. Basically, it's a way to give us some money to help offset the costs of the podcast. Yes, thank you for supporting the podcast, whether it's by leaving comments, referring us to friends, or by joining the Becoming Ellie private Facebook group. Today, Heike Yates is joining us. We talked with her ages ago in episode 71, and we're so happy to get to talk with her again. I think this conversation is a great way to kick off 2024. Let's go to the podcast. Heike Yates, a midlife mindset and fitness coach, is a powerhouse in fitness, nutrition, and mindset with over 35 years of expertise. She breaks down the complexities of midlife wellness into simple, actionable steps you can start taking with action today. But don't mistake her for someone helping you to get by in midlife. Hike is all about helping you thrive. She's transforming not just bodies, but lives with her unique approach to getting active, eating right, and boosting energy. When she's not coaching or behind the mic, Catch her outdoors, pushing her limits as a triathlete or embarking on a new adventure. Heike's podcast, Pursue Your Spark, has over 200 episodes and is a wealth of resources and inspiration for midlife women. Heike also has two other podcasts, one about intermittent fasting and one about Pilates. Bill and I interviewed Heike in November of 2020 with episode number 71. And we also reconnected with her in August of 2023 at a podcast conference in Boulder, Colorado. We had such a great time together that we knew we had to ask her to return to the podcast. Welcome, Heike. It's so great to get together to talk with you again. Oh, my God. I can't believe we know each other for so long already. This is fantastic. (laughs) It's amazing, isn't it? I went and looked at the old original episode that we did. I was like, I can't believe it was so long ago. (laughs) I know. I'm so delighted to be back. I love to see both of you. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. And we really want to talk to you about mindset because it seems like a good time of year to do that. Uh, But let's just sort of first talk about your basic ideas of fitness and eating. What kind of fitness do you recommend? Oh, my goodness. The one that's the best is the one you like the most. <laughs> that is the fitness, the fitness you, the, the, the one I recommend. You know, there are so many experts out there, especially this time of the year, that recommend certain types of exercises or eating approaches. And we don't know if they work for us and they all sound great. But bottom line, when it comes to fitness, do what you love, because I love to be outside. When, if I can go outside, this is just my, my superpower. When I can go outside biking or running or now walking and hiking, I'm in heaven. I don't need anything else. I don't need a gym. I don't need anything else. And that's, that's the best exercise for me to go outside, get, get sunshine, uh, get some more vitamin D and do what I love being outside. Yes. And I, Based on that answer, I I know you practice intermittent fasting. Yeah. Is that something that you recommend to most of your clients, some of your clients, or it's just how how do you uh, approach that with your clients? I'm a huge fan of intermittent fasting, and I mention it to everybody that I work with, and my programs are also uh, intermittent fasting based. But in the end, Chris, it's really about what we eat, how we eat, 
that nourishes our life and our body. Is intermittent fasting good for everybody, works for everybody? No. Someone just yesterday on, on uh, social asked me and she said, oh, those fasting windows, they're flexible, right? You should be fasting uh, not always the same time to get results. And my answer was, well, it depends. In Heike's world, it always depends. It really depends on is this fasting window working for you? Is intermittent fasting something you can incorporate into your life? Is it something that uh, works with your lifestyle? If you love breakfast and you love, love your three meals, maybe intermittent fasting is not for you, but you can always go back into or add the mindfulness aspect that intermittent fasting brings to the table. Because we're encouraging everybody to eat mindfully and with awareness instead of scarfing down whatever is there and then just hoping that that fasting window will do its magic and we're losing the weight and we're getting fit and we're, we're, we're healing our guts. So it all depends on what do we want from intermittent fasting and why do we want it? So the the idea that okay, I'm going to keep eating tonight and I'll just extend my window and eat <laughs> later tomorrow is probably not really the way to go. <laughs> it's not ideally not the way to go. There's There has to be a, a making sense to what it is we're doing with it. <laughs> yeah, And that then comes back into nutrient dense foods or calorie dense foods. But that's a, you know, that's just a side note on it. Yeah. Okay. I want to circle back to the fitness and food in a little bit later, but let's talk about mindset first. Many people make New Year's goals, resolutions. January is a big time for that. So I think it's a safe bet that many of our listeners have committed to a variety of ways of becoming fit and strong in 2024. What advice do you have for someone trying to make health or fitness changes in the new year? Change as little as possible. Okay. Okay. Change as little as possible because what we feel like that the new year gives us a, a boost in the booty saying, all right, here <laughs> we go. This is my chance now. I have not been successful all year, but this is the magic line where I step over and this time it's really going to work. And that's why you find that the gyms are packed the first six weeks of the year. All fitness equipment has been bought over Christmas because we had such good intentions. But bottom line is we will feel bored. We will feel overwhelmed. We feel that we just hate it. Whatever we started doing, whether it's an exercise or an eating plan or a combination of those, and it can be right out overwhelming. If you're just wanting to turn your health and fitness upside down, all at once and saying, woohoo, it's going to happen. Or you say, I'm going to do the six week challenge. Not much is going to happen. You'll be frustrated. You'll be hungry. You'll be tired. You'll be sore, most likely. And that's not a motivation to continue with the strategy for the rest of our life. And that's what I think is really important in our midlife that we're creating habits that are sustainable, things we love doing, that we love to pick the exercise that we have. Do you think there's any differences in having a goal or goals around starting or restarting a fitness program or changing the way we eat? A goal, in my opinion, is always something good to have. It's like a dream. We need a dream. What would, what could my life look like if I were to be perfect, which we're not? And we've got to. <laughs> also say that we're not, and that's okay. Please do not try to be perfect. But we're thinking about, can I sustain this? Can I keep going with where I'm going with, with what I've decided? And where do I go? If I don't have a plan and I just say, ah, I'm just going to get fit this year. That's a kind of a vague goal. But if you say, I want to bicycle around my lake in my neighborhood, that's a more specific goal. Or I want to join with the goal in the end, I want to join a bicycle club, just to use that as an example. So it needs what I like to call baby steps that we keep going and there's, we're having these little stepping stones. And so we need a dream. We need a goal. If you don't like the word goal, a dream of what could life be like? So how do we go about crafting that plan? <laughs> I steps. say I have a dream. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> trying to figure it all out and I have it pictured, but how, yeah, what do we how do? How do you do it? <laughs> okay. Go and always, I like lists, write down the things you love about yourself. Not about the things you can do or can't do. What do you love about yourself? Do you love about yourself that your legs are really strong? Do you love about yourself that you can schlep heavy things? Do you love about yourself how flexible you are and you can touch your toes? Or what delicious meals you're making? Think about something that makes you feel good about yourself that you're good at and then go from there. Let's take, for example, if you're you always, and that's just profess, that's a story. Think about, you always tell yourself, oh, I got those big legs and oh, those <laughs> legs and I want to get them slimmer and I want to get, get the, I talked about this this morning with a client about the thigh gap. And I think we're all old enough to know that we used to have the goal of having thigh gaps as women, which is just impossible because you have to be like supermodel thin and not have an ounce of weight on you. But Think about you have these really strong legs. And instead of thinking, "Ah, man, I need to get them thinner. I need to get them sculpted more. What can those legs do? Those legs can lift stuff. They can garden like there's no tomorrow. They can go for a great hike. So this is an asset. I got these strong legs. Let's put them to work. What can I do with those strong legs? It really flips the way you think about things, isn't it? That's that's great. Really then setting a goal is using what are your assets rather than, you know, like if I have a goal of, I want, I want to get thinner legs. That's more like focusing on the negative, isn't it? Correct. Whereas if I say, I don't know that I have strong legs. See, and then make my goal. I want to, I want to do a five day hiking trip. Go, the way I look about it is like, think about what is your, you look at your legs and you say, you know, my legs are my asset. Instead of looking at them negatively and making myself feel bad about myself, I look at them for in a positive way and use them as my asset. So I say, oh, I want to hike Machu Picchu. That's a clear dream goal. And I hiked Machu Picchu and it has a lot of stairs and you need really strong legs for that. And in the, in the, process of using the positivity about your your asset, you will feel better about yourself than thinking, oh, I need to get the thigh gap. I need to get thinner legs. It's like, no, look how far my legs carried me today. It's like the idea of making a list of the things you love about yourself. Exactly. Because we tend to not think that way. No, nope. most women put themselves down and and about their bodies, and instead of saying, "Oh, look at what I'm," I already have. One of the years I used to be a running coach for the Montgomery County Road Runners, where I live in Maryland, and I used to be the running coach. I would usually walk or run behind the group as the the coach. I would like you guys run ahead, and I'd be the back of the coach, and I just make sure that we don't lose anybody. And we had a shirt at one year. And that said, all you need is all you got. Oh, that's cool. All you need is all you got. All you got. You don't need anything more. You don't need anything fancy. You don't need any gadgets. You don't need any other. You have it already within you. And when you're digging out this positivity, this strength that we all carry within us, it's a game changer. You know, I noticed on your website that you offer a blueprint for women in midlife. Is this a course? And can you give us an overview of what a blueprint like that might look like? It's like a little roadmap. It's like the little uh, stepping stones. It's <laughs> it's an eight-week online course for women only. And in this course, I teach intermittent fasting strategies combined with Pilates and strength training, which is taught over the course of eight weeks and uh we'll, we're small groups and it's myself as the as the head coach and I love sharing this combination because I found that for my body and I'm now 62 it has made a difference in the strength the flexibility from the from a fitness perspective but also from a intermittent fasting. I started intermittent fasting when I had microscopic colitis and the two already uh, coincided. So I started 
intermittent fasting not to lose body weight or to lose weight initially, but more of healing my gut. A feeling what the combination of the two is, I think it's the most powerful way to have a low impact exercise form, a form that strengthens your bones and your muscles and heals your gut and f- makes you f- feel better physically and gives you more energy as the process of autophagy is part of intermittent fasting. And so I put all of this together and I said, this is just, I love it. It's great. I, everybody needs to do this <laughs> and they don't need any equipment. They can use water bottles. We use our own body and Pilates has the mat work, Pilates mat work that we infuse with all the, all the other exercises. And the cool thing is too, if we, if you're saying, especially in the new year, I don't have time to do all this. The exercises are only 15 minutes long, so you can do them either halfway or all the way, whenever you fit them in best in your day. They're just not like, I have to start at 8 o'clock in the morning. If lunchtime is your workout time, that's the time. And intermittent fasting is something that you gradually change. And we're playing around with this in the course to see how we extend the fast And for my experience in the past, some uh, participants have said, okay, 12 hours is all I want to do, which is basically an overnight fast. But here are the healthy eating habits. Here's where we're going to hone in on what gives us what I like to call the bang for the buck of energy. And uh, that's what we're doing in the Pursue Your Spark Blueprint. I was just talking with someone about intermittent fasting and people doing like sort of the keto diet with that. And I said, it ends up feeling like a 20 year old man's idea of eating. So there's, a you know, like, let's eat tons of bacon and cheese. And, <laughs> <laughs> and we'll eat for four hours and just eat bacon and cheese. <laughs> you know, and that's a good point, Jill. Uh, it's we do not practice the keto diet, because it is keto diet. Now, the keto diet was initially comes from There's another diet, and I can't think of the name right now. It was developed. Atkins, Atkins, thank you. The Atkins diet, which was developed for heart patients. Now, the people that do keto are not heart patients. They may want to lower their cholesterol. That seems to work for some people, but it's not a lifestyle. You know, eating one-sided. Yes, and the A1C for some people actually goes the other way or their cholesterol numbers skyrocket with that because thank you so it it is very true because i have one i have one client who had great results and actually it's a friend and another friend who's like this is not working for me i'm like why would you do it and the people that go on keto diets everybody i've come across said i lost 20 or 30 pounds on the keto diet it was great but then i gained it all back plus It's not normal eating. You know, I want to have my cake and eat it too because I know I will crave it at some point. I love bread and I limit it, but I don't exclude food groups. I know you. I go into a certain restaurant and I say, this place has the best bread ever. I'm going to eat it, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Well, there's something about deprivation that from a mindset standpoint kind of sets you up for at least me. I guess I'm talking about myself, but if I say I can't have that, I can't have that, I can't have that, guess what I'm thinking about all the time? That. (laughs) That's exactly right. So that makes it really hard. And this is when we're talking about almost a revolution in ourselves because we rebel against these dieting. We're rebelling. I I want this. Why shouldn't I have this? And then once you have it, you're going all out and you say, no, I'm going to show you, I will eat all this no matter what. And the rebel comes out and then it backfires into overeating. So it's a catch 22, but you can make better choices. If you're going to your favorite restaurant, you don't have to eat the whole bucket of bread. You maybe share it with somebody, right? Although it's hard, but (laughs) Well, that's what uh, the first thing you said out of the gate really resonated with me is take the baby steps, do as little as possible to reach your goal so that you can be consistent. I mean, I don't think you said so you can be consistent, but that's what I was thinking because everyone tends to make a goal, a big, hairy, audacious goal, the BHAG kind of thing. And then you start into it full force and then it just 
fails, or I, you know, I guess I'm talking about myself more than everyone else, but it, the baby steps does work for me for sure. I know it does. I know it does. And when, when I bring up the baby steps with my clients who also uh, come in and say, Oh, this year I'm going to lose another 10 pounds. And uh, actually I said this just this morning, client comes in and says, I want to lose another 10 pounds. And I said, all right, so uh, what are you going to do? I said, you joined Weight Watchers. And she said, yeah, but I have not been to any of the meetings in the last year. I was like, okay, no problem. You know, whatever. And this is also, I have to preface, this is a client who has rheumatoid arthritis. She's young, has rheumatoid arthritis. So she's now on medication. So she actually can work out. Before she was in so much pain, we barely could work out. So the pain is masked. She's lost some weight because we're doing Pilates. We're doing a little bit of strength. She does a little yoga on her own. And she joined the Weight Watchers just in case, I guess. And she said, I really want to lose those last 10 pounds. And I said, well, how would that look like? What would you have to do? I said, 10 pounds is a lot. And she said, well, I heard that in menopause, we all gain weight and that we all keep it on. And I said, that's not true. Everybody is different. Some women gain weight, others don't. It's totally individual. But one thing is true, we're, we are uh, losing estrogen and we're lower on progesterone, so our skin is flabbier and we're feeling looser. And I said, that's why our, we get to look a little wider. We may not fit in our clothes and we may look like we, or we actually gained a little bit of weight. But I said, well, what is it you're going to do? And she said, well you know, eat less, maybe exercise a little bit more. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's uh, the the old strategies we've been hearing about. And that's what we recommended maybe like 10 years ago. And some people still say that. But in essence, we are now in menopause, post-menopause, somewhere around that. And these strategies just don't work anymore. That you say, if I eat less, I'm going to lose weight. If I exercise more, they don't. But a sensible approach to all of this. And I asked her, I said, how bad do you really want to lose that weight? What are you willing to do in order to get as lean as you imagined it? And she stopped for a moment and she said, I don't know. I would have to be really writing everything down, be very strict with my diet, continue exercising and hoping that something happens. And I said, yeah, it may not, nothing may ever happen. You will get stronger because you're working out. You will feel better because you eat less crappy food, which you shouldn't do anyways. But it's what do we want from our health? What do we want from our bodies? Is it the extra five or 10 pounds? Do, do they really make a big difference? To some in our mindset, yes, when you look in the mirror and you see yourself naked and say, I wish I would be my 20s, dang, but then we're not. <laughs> <laughs> so we got to work with what we got. And so she's still thinking about what she's doing. I said, think about foremost is your health. Are you healthy? Is your cholesterol low? We, we touched on that one. Is your blood pressure okay? At this a stage in our lives, our focus on health has to be other than weight. Weight's an easy one to go to because you just get up in the morning, you hop on the scale, and it becomes a focus. You talk about creating boundaries and that it's okay to say no. Absolutely. I have to say that I think of that as something that you get. I get told to do about things like time management for work or whatever, but I've never really thought about it in terms of healthy living or eating or fitness or whatever. So what do you mean by that, that it's okay to say no? It's okay to say no for a second helping of food. It's okay to say no at the holiday table because everybody wants you to try all their food. It's okay to say no when somebody forces fried food on you and you know it's unhealthy for you. It's okay to say no that you do not want to drink alcohol because you decided that this is not what you want to do. And somebody says, come on, a glass won't hurt. It's okay to say no when it comes to exercise. If somebody wants you to do something you absolutely hate or you know you just don't like it. It's okay to hurt other people's feelings by making yourself a priority. That's what I mean by that. It's okay to say no. No, 
No, I don't want this. I don't want to be treated like this. I don't want to feel like this. I don't want to be in a class where you're the superstar and I'm the loser, air quotes, mm. uh, because I can't follow the class because I don't do dancing moves. <laughs> mm, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> Boy, I was just picturing how I cleverly dance right around the corner and out of the class because <laughs> I can't do those dances. <laughs> it is like a personal boundary within the saying no to me. It is something, it has to be good for me. It has to be healthy for me. It has to make me happy. And if it's none of those, it gets a no, which is hard, especially with friends and family. Because again, we don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, but then we're lying to ourselves and then we're playing a different role. And that, that gives us a, again, gives us the mindset of guilt, which is what we so much deal with is we feel guilty about everything. We feel guilty if we eat the pie or not. We feel guilty if we don't go for a walk with our friend or not. We feel guilty of saying no to all the things that we know are not good for us. So we feel guilty. We don't want to hurt anybody's feeling feelings. And it becomes this catch 22. So no, just say, no, I don't want to dance. I don't like to dance. <laughs> <laughs> just as an example, I love dancing. All the listeners, I love, love, love dancing. Sometimes we get in our own way. And if we don't eat the way we wanted to one day or we miss a workout, we think all is lost and why bother? So how do you help women get over this idea of perfection, all or nothing? The perfectionism trap is huge and we all deal with it no matter whether it's eating or exercising or office work, uh, whatever it is, being perfect is an illusion. The perfectionism is something that I'm sure all of us were taught from our parents. We have to be the perfect child. We have to behave perfectly at the dinner table. We have to not scream. We have to be nice all the time. We have to be friendly to people and hug people we don't like to hug. But we were taught that being the perfect child is our gateway to happiness. If everything's just perfect, then I'll be happy. If, every, if I'm if I'm just abiding by all the rules and never say no, everything will be perfect because then I will not ruffle feathers. I will be the perfect person that everybody wants me to be without taking into account what you really want, which comes, in my opinion, back to the boundaries. Perfection, the perfectionism trap is it will never be perfect because you will set the standards or the bar higher each time. This is not the meal is not good enough. It's not pretty enough. The food's not cut in the right pieces enough. It doesn't have enough sauce. It's not served on the right plate. We're not eating it with the right fork. It's never ending. So how do we stop it? Just stop. Just live it in the moment and look at it and say, you know what? This is great. Look what I accomplished, which goes back to what we talked earlier. I made this fantastic meal. Is everything perfect? No, but it's dang good and everybody will love it. And it's hard to get out of the perfectionism trap. Again, especially as women, we're so primed to be the good girl. Do you think that tracking habits really helps us to stay committed to our goals? And if so, do you recommend any special apps or other ways of tracking? Tracking is, again, very individualized. I know so many people who hate tracking, hate writing. It takes too much time. It's too fiddly. It's, it's, I don't want to do it. I don't want to write it down. I wouldn't want to use an app. You have to be the right person to want to track. If you want to track, you can use an app like Lose It or My Fitness Pal, the very, the free options. Uh, if you want to track your fitness, you can get a Garmin or an Apple Watch that are very commonly used to track fitness. Be aware when you're tracking what it is, the result you want. Do you want to track that I eat a vegetable with every meal? Do you want to track I'm getting faster on a 10K? So there's a lot of different tracking variables there. Do I want to track my weight? Do I, you mentioned the scale earlier, Chris. Uh, do I want to step on the scale once a week? That's my measure. Do I uh, use one of those apps. So what is it that we really want to track when it comes to tracking? And am I the right 
person to track. One of my clients just said the other day, she hired, aside from myself, she hired another trainer. And the first thing they did with her is they wanted her to track her food intake. And I was like, hmm, why? And she says, oh, no, no, no. I have mentioned that I wanted to lose weight. Here's the lose weight business again. And I told them, I will never do it. I will not even start it. I just hate it. And I say, but that's, again, what is your goal? Now, this is a person that has early onset of Parkinson's. So tracking for her is nothing, means nothing to her. But getting stronger, staying healthier, longer, dealing with her um, evolution in her body is quite important. So it comes down to what do you want to track? Why do you want to track? What is the dream? What is the goal? So if you like to track and you like data, go for it. Go for it. If you know, get a, I have a Garmin that tracks all my activities, swimming, biking, running, and all that good hiking and stuff. And that's pretty much for myself. That's all I track. There's a, like, like the apps I mentioned, there's, I'm sure there's a hundred bazillion apps out now. Uh, you can track, if you want to track your food, you can do that, but it has to be something that gives meaning to your goal. I was showing a woman at the gym how to use her garment to look at her VO2 max. And so that is something I try to watch. I have this little mini goal. Of, if I can get that to go up just a bit, I'd be happy. Love it. Love it. Absolutely. Maybe you could explain what VO2 max is, Joe. I bet some of our listeners aren't familiar oh, with it. Oh, basically, the, it's a fitness measurement that they use about how your body uses oxygen. And you can do not, I don't think it's necessarily really elaborate, but they do a test where you ride on a bike or do something with a mask on your face and they watch the intake of oxygen and outtake, whatever. It's It has to do with your body using oxygen. But the Garmin somehow estimates that from your, you know, from your, a strap on your wrist and your, must be from your heart rate and all of the data it has about your body. And it gives me a number. And like it says to me, you're in the top 10% of your, of women your age. And I'm like, well, maybe I could get to 5%. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. What does, what does oxygen do? It gives us energy. It has our blood circulating. It, it helps our lungs stay healthy. As we age, we're also breathing less uh, and a much shallower breather. So getting in more air is a win-win right there. More power to you, Jill. Yeah, and that's the neat thing about wearables is you have your wearable and there's usually a, a website where it collects all your information and you just can follow it, which makes it way easier than having to write things down and log things by by thumb or by finger and uh, typing it all in. Yeah, I haven't found a wearable yet that really tracks what you eat. You know, it's like you have to enter all that in either to Mind Fitness Pal or losing it, one of those apps. Or I know some people that track their food by taking a picture of their plate before they eat it. And then that is what they use is just their food pictures. And I, I guess that's one way of doing it. Cause you know, one thing I've been trying to do is uh, eat more vegetables and that sort of helps me is when I take pictures of what I eat, but I have another question for you. What do you say when your clients say they're too old to do something? You know, is, is there a way to feel more youthful or more flexible or how do you approach that when someone says they're too old to do something? All right. I have the perfect story for you, ladies and gentlemen, anybody's listening. Just as of two weeks ago, my client who uh, took a leave of absence before COVID returned to Pilates. He is 98 years old. Wow. He is very kyphotic. That means he has a very bent forward back, which is hereditary from his family. His dad had it. So he's always what we call stooped over. And I started working with him and his wife. So he was back then. He was 92, 94. He was 94. So she was three years long, younger. So he's now 98. He comes to Pilates. He does Pilates. He hasn't done anything in a long, 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 long time. And you can tell because he's very stiff. 
So he's starting now. This was his third week back training with me, and I only work with him because I feel a little nervous working with two people. And they come in person, so that's not a virtual uh, cause he has balance issues. He doesn't hear well. So all the, th- the things that we get when we get older, we don't see well, we don't hear well, we lose balance and we lose strength. So he has all of them. And so he's shown up and he's doing Pilates and his wife is, she said, I'm much better off than he is, which she is because she used to clean her house, hang up curtains, be active in the house. And I know that's not the answer to your question. But I want you to picture this. There is 98 and 95. They drive themselves to my studio with the with an app. They get to the studio. They leave an hour early just to get there on time. Then it takes them 15 minutes to do whatever they're doing for him to get ready. She reads a book or she's sewing or something like this. And then we do our Pilates session and balance and every, I mean, all kinds of things that I can think of. And then... They drive. And she said, Heike, this is the highlight of his week to come to you and Pilates. So you are never too old to start. It depends on what you do and who you work with that you can trust. And I know we've worked together for such a long time now, even the the four years we've been apart and all these things. He's back. He's doing Pilates. It may look a little different than what you see on social. But it still is strength training, balance training. So don't wait. You're never too old. You're never too broken, as I like to call it, to start something towards your health. Any form of exercise, whether it's breathing only, if all you can sit in a chair and breathe, That's exercise, expanding your lungs. And just like you said, Jill, with uh, getting my VO2 max up, I'm like, if you can't breathe because you have scoliosis or you have whatever you have, it's exercise. If you do stretches, it's exercise. If you learn to get in and out of a chair, it's exercise. You can always go harder. And I know some of the listeners may say, ah, you're doing all old people stuff. We all start somewhere. Not everybody is super fit. And some people may just start now in their 50s or even 60s with exercise because they realize that it's a much better quality of life, getting older, feeling better. It's not, again, it's not perfect, but it's definitely better. You have better alignment. You have better posture. You breathe better. You move better. And what's not to like about this aspect of longevity? And we are getting older as my client, 98. And she said, Heike, he's your oldest client ever, right? And I said, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I heard a woman at the gym and she was elderly, but she said, I used to tell my children that I was spending their inheritance by coming to the gym. She said, and then it occurred to me, now I tell them I'm saving them money because the more I work out, apparently she hires a trainer. She said, the more I work with my trainer, the longer I'm staying out of a nursing home. Bingo. <laughs> She's got the right attitude. Instead of an expense, it's an investment. And and actually, that goes back to what you said before about listing what you love. It's not quite the same, but it is coming at something, spending the money from a positive point rather than from I'm spending my children's inheritance to I'm saving them money by staying out healthy. Or I'm investing in myself. That's what I like to say too. So one thing we hear a lot about is mindfulness. And do you know what that is? And how do we cultivate that? And why? (laughs) (laughs) Mindfulness is this big umbrella of stuff. It starts by learning about yourself. And it it taps on all the things that we talked about, perfectionism, letting go, saying no. It's And it's who am I as the person? What do I want from my life? How do I picture myself going forward? Starting at that mindfulness translates and into all aspects of life. When you think about letting go of being that girl that has to be the perfect good girl, letting go of our past working with ourselves to free ourselves from these burdens that have been 
placed upon us as a, as children unintended by our parents because they all mean well. And I'm a parent, so I'll mean well with my children. But letting go of things that, you know, you may have thought about and you said, you know, I'm not a good mom. I could have been a better mom to my children. You need to let go of this because we always do the best we can wherever we are. For instance, nutrition mindfulness, eating mindful, being aware of what we eat. Don't just eat, watch TV, or even just eat and not even taste anything and just be done. Given there's some foodies and there's there some not foodies. So some people eat food because they just need food. Others just devour it because it's delicious and it's tasty and it's crunchy and it looks good. But being aware of what you do, when you do your workouts, I always say in Pilates, we're not going fast. We're going slow. So we can experience the breath, the movement. How does it feel in the body? How does it all tie together with how our body needs to function today? Where are we mentally today? Are we stressed out by listening to the news? Or are we coming from a place that we feel relaxed, that we just had gone for a walk, we cleared our mind? These are all steps of mindfulness that are actions that bring us towards our better health, to our better selves. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. Yes. You know, people are always saying, eat mindfully. I have to say, one of my favorite things has always been to prop a book up at the table and eat my food. And so when people would say eat mindfully, I was like, I really hate to give this up. I This is my one guilty pleasure in life. <laughs> then this is what you do. And I don't do it at every meal, of course, but I do like to sit and read my book while I eat my lunch. But that gives you a different kind of mindfulness. It doesn't pay give you mindfulness on the food. It doesn't give you uh, mindfulness on, on the, on the um, acti- activity of eating, but it gives you peace of mind because you're starting to relax. You're eating something that nourishes your body. You feel good afterwards. And you read a good book, which makes your mind feel relaxed, enjoyed, and you had a good time. Yes. <laughs> you, you you are mindful, but not just by air quotes again, by the books. And so when we when we think about this, you know, if I would say, oh, yeah, you know what, Jill, you shouldn't be doing this because that's really not how we do this. That wouldn't work with your lifestyle because you enjoy it and it makes you happy. So on your website and social media, I've read that you help women navigate fear and judgment. And can you talk to us about that? Fear and judgment. These are two, two, two different buckets. When we talk about fear, it's the fear of not being perfect, the fear of get being guilty, the fear of not living up to other people's expectations, the fear of not enough, that we're not enough is a a big fear of many that we we don't live up to other people's expectations being judged ties closely in with fear but there's such strong big buckets that we're judged for not being a good mom we're we're, fe- we're we in fear of being judged for how we do things we're in fear of judged how we exercise how we live our life so judgment and fear even though they're so big buckets, I think of them, they are connected and it's, it's nice that you bring them up together, but it's like, oh, we can talk about fear. We can talk about judgment. What do we want to talk about on this together? I think we need to let go of the fear of being judged. I would sum these two big buckets up. Stop. You're, you're good enough. You are pretty enough. You are skinny or heavy enough or whatever enough. You're, you're never strong enough. You can always get stronger. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the judgment I have about myself. Man, I used to be stronger. I think of that so often. How do I get over that? Like, you know, gosh, I used to be able to do blah, blah, blah. How do you get over judging yourself? By honoring your preferences, by being kind to yourself, being forgiving to your perceived shortcomings because where where does it come from where does that oh i i used to be so strong okay what happened in the middle what have you accomplished <laughs> what have you what has how's how has your life been 
what have you, have you changed jobs? Have you birthed children? Did you take care of our elderly parents? Did you have another career change? Did you travel the world? You know, what, what happened from back then and now? And when, when people say oftentimes going on social media, Oh, what would you tell your younger self? It's a question I really dislike. <laughs> I would tell my younger self, you had a ball and go girl. Do more. <laughs> Do more of that. Bring it back. So it's think about what happened, you know, from, from that time when you, oh, I used to be this to now. What, what did you, Chris, experience as a positive? Yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah. And thinking of the future, the future me asked, what would you write to the younger me, which would be right now? It would be exactly what you just said. <laughs> you go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of worrying about, gee, when I was 40, gee, when I was 30, you know. And it's it's all these worry. Then we go back to guilt and then we go back to fear, to those emotions that we all need to let go of or let go as much as possible. And I know it's tough. It's tough inner work to recognize these things. And I struggle with this every day. And I realized something. I I said just something to my husband and I said, oh, did I just say that to him? That was not nice. <laughs> and then I go back and I said, you know, I'm really sorry. I just realized I used that tone. And he says, I don't even remember. <laughs> but in my head, I'm like, oh, my God. What did I do? And so the mindset part is is something that many of us don't want to tackle. It's easier to talk about weight loss, not strong enough, need to be more flexible. But where does it all come from? Is there a reason that why we want that? Is it because we saw so-and-so on social media being super flexible and we thought, oh, this is great. I've never been flexible. Or is it because you said, you know what? I feel better. My bones are achy when I don't stretch. You know, where does it come from? Being mindful then of your body. What is, what's the message our body sends us? And women are very good at not listening to those messages in our bodies that are warning us saying, Hey, you need to do something about this. And we're all saying, no, we're fine. We're okay. We'll, we'll, we'll deal. If I decide I'm going to work out at home, this is going to be a motivation question. How do I motivate myself to do that? Or for that matter, if I go to the gym, how do I motivate myself to do more than my inclination might be? You know, like, oh, that's good enough. Well, that's a good question. Because if you're going to the gym, you're already motivated to do more. I think getting your butt ski there is already motivation enough to get in there. Being at home, I think it's a little harder because you go back or we're going back to what do you like to do? And uh, in the near future, you'll see me on a reel on Instagram dancing around my kitchen because I want to reinforce that women can just exercise by dancing while cooking their meal. So this will be in the near future. But what is something that you like to do? Remember, motivation is a a false narrative. What does motivation mean? Some people may not be motivated to exercise because they just don't like it. Others go gung ho and do it. Let's let's you know do more of it. Let's do harder exercises. Pick something that you like to do, and let's assume that this person likes to move just in general. Uh, the person that doesn't like any that doesn't like to move has a little bit more to tackle. But go about. I would say, do some squ- air squats while you're waiting for your tea kettle to boil. Do some lunges while you walk from your desk to your next destination in the kitchen. Sit on the couch and do some tricep dips. Super easy, right? It's just a matter of thinking about it. Do but what I've done also real on is kitchen counter push-ups. You're in the kitchen, you're, you're waiting or you're doing something, you can do a couple of push-ups. Now, you may say, that's not enough. Oh, those three push-ups here and those five lunges there. It all adds up to more. And you may like it. You may like it so much that you say, you know what? Now I'm ready to maybe do some Pilates and lie on the floor and do some stuff. Or I, you know, pick up my water bottles and I do something with my arms uh, that I've seen somewhere. But 
it comes down to what is it that you can fit in easily at home. That's again, I mean, so little that it's almost not obvious that you're exercising in the sense of exercising. I'm giving air quotes again. It's like, it's play. It's fun. This is great. I can feel my arms. Oh, I can feel my butt ski. Oh, this is good on my legs. Uh, so that's a, just a start. Or if like you, like me, want to go outside, go outside, put on that coat and just walk down the street, see how it feels. And maybe you want to go longer. Maybe you don't. Take those, what I like to call little exercise snacks. Do a couple lunges. Uh, the other, the other, well, there's another reel why I exercise with my kitchen pot. I was just in the kitchen. I'm thinking, ooh, this is heavy. I can use it as an exercise tool. And so I started doing arm things and I videoed it, of course. But that's a good way. In the gym, if you are already going to the gym, ask a professional. Ask somebody to help you. Say, hey, you know what? I'm doing all this and I'm a little bit bored. You know, help me with a new program or show me new exercises. And the same goes if you prefer, like we're now doing online Zoom calls and I train my clients on Zoom as well. So you have Zoom calls where you work with your client that's at home, which then makes gives it more motivation because somebody comes and teaches you and it's is there for you. So a coach could be a good help for either, either scenario. So it depends on where you want to start. It's all like, again, individual. And if you're the person who does not like exercising, I would hire a coach. I have two clients who, who say, I'm only here because of you. I paid you. You're waiting for me. And if uh, I would feel terrible if you would wait for me and I don't show up. And I said, yeah, I would too, because I would call you and I would give you a hard time because you said you would come. But that's that would be a good way to motivate somebody in a way that it's not an internal motivation that you don't overcome your inner. <laughs> and in, in the session too, some people think when you hire a trainer, it has to be all gung ho hard. I have certain sessions where my clients want to talk more about themselves and their problems and their emotions that they have than exercise. So I'm like, okay, just pour it out. How can I help you? Because that's what a coach does. It helps you not with gossiping and, and talking about the neighbors, but with, with things that you may struggle with that you don't feel like, feel comfortable talking to, uh, to other people. You know, when we think about our hairdresser, my hairdresser knows a lot of stuff because I know she's not <laughs> going to talk to any of my friends. She's not going to talk to anybody else. And that's the same as a coach. You have a privacy policy where you do not share that information that was shared with you. And, and that's also an opportunity to say, you know what? I'm struggling with X, Y, and Z. What do you think? It's like being a mindset coach too. Yep. <laughs> Not just an exercise coach. So you've recommended fitness programs that seem to be a combination of strength training and Pilates. Is that correct? Like wh why these two programs? Because it's the best, I would say. No, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> no. You know, women, Pilates, when you look at Pilates, it's, it's very similar to yoga in, in the sense that it's, it's, it promotes longevity because it, Pilates is low impact to no impact. It's easy on the joints. It has proven, uh, to increase bone density in the spine, not in the hip because it's not a weight bearing, uh, exercise like walking, but increases bone density in the spine. And it builds what we call in Pilates a long, lean muscle belly or lean muscles. Now, if you technically talk to somebody that's just thinking uh, strength training, there is no such thing as building a lean, long muscle. So what we really are saying is we're building muscles that are not bulky in Pilates. And that's where the long, lean idea comes from. And when you think of a lot of former Pilates teachers are that initially started or trained with Joseph Pilates, they were all dancers. So you think long, lean muscle belly. So it is really, really good for people with back problems, Pilates, with posture problems, people that want to get in touch or learn how to use their core correctly, get a stronger core which supports the whole spine, uh, also with scolios scoliosis or other um, conditions like that. But also it can be a kick-buttsky workout. 
we're using when you're going into a class. We're using resistance and uh, um, springs to create resistance, and that's where the resistance training comes in. In the math class, we oftentimes use bands to make it easier when we're talking about my classes. All they need to get is some resistant bands to to get that same feel of working against resistance, improving uh, muscle tone and strength. Now, strength training is super duper important for us perimenopause and postmenopausal to increase our bone density, number one, and our muscle mass because we have sarcopenia starting at the age of 30 and we're losing all of this hard earned muscle mass. So we're losing our hormones, we're losing our estrogen and progesterone goes down and we're getting older and we're losing all of our hard earned muscles. So it's time to pick up heavier weights. If you not just, you know, the 15, 20 repetitions kind of thing, that's more like for the gentleman I was mentioning earlier, that's a different age group. But think you want to pick up heavy weights where you're challenged, where you can build up that bone density and the muscle strength, because we're losing all of this. We need to push against it. Um, to, to maintain our strength and, and, uh, overall, uh, alignment of our body. That's why these two. I used to teach yoga, but Pilates just spoke to me. Pilates was my thing. I was like, yeah, that's, that's the thing. <laughs> Sparks your joy. Spark right. my joy. Totally. So what kind of strength training do you suggest? Do we need to go to the gym in order to do that? I was going to say, you're going to ask me about hit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, we could ask you about that, too. <laughs> <laughs> because so many of of the women I talk to, they're like, I should be doing HIT, high-intensity interval training. That's, to me, lift weights, run around. Do, do this really fast and a lot of it in the shortest period of time. So 20 minutes, done. Now, a problem I see with that is impact. Things done really fast, like I'm... I'd be honest, I have arthritis in my knee. I do not want to do another jumping jack in my life. I do not want to do another mountain climber in my life if I can avoid it. I want to do something that's good on my joints. I want something that is low impact in nature, but still, and is controlled in movement. So talking about the high intensity interval class, it doesn't have, it doesn't check any of the marks. You will find now high intensity, low impact interval classes too, because the market caught on that we need to change something. The, the ladies don't want to do it anymore. Let's, let's have them the low impact. If that's your thing, if you like to run around, lift, lift weights really fast, it's your thing. It's not my thing. And that's why I also don't recommend it. Now going to the gym is optional. You have a body, use it. Go to the playground, go do Pilates mat work, do some push-ups, do uh, the, the most favorite from all, side planks. Nobody likes side planks. Just <laughs> so many body weight exercises that we can do that we do not need to buy anything. It's nice to have a little extra something to change the workout up. Absolutely but you don't have to go to the gym to be fit. And how many people go out there as we get older and they say, you know what? All I do is I'm hiking, I'm wearing a heavy backpack and I'm doing garden work. End of story. And that's their workout. So that's the thing that people are doing now is putting heavy things in backpacks and hiking around. I forget what that's called. Rucking. Yes, that's it. Rucking. There's a name for it. I didn't even realize there was a name for that. It's a that's a military term, rucking. Yes, but that seems to be a very popular workout right now. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yep, it's you know it's bad for your back if you don't have a strong core. <laughs> okay, so if you're going to do that, you should be practicing your Pilates. Bingo, because we you know imagine. <clears throat> Imagine just uh, go, saying, oh, I'm going to go hike. I'm going to put 10 pounds in my backpack and off I go. You know, you have probably terrible postures. You're not conditioned for that workout. You haven't probably hiked in forever. And now you're starting to be all G.I. Jane and off you go. Now you have to, you know, work up to it. Do the baby steps, get a strong core 
keep keep hiking and then slowly add weight to the backpack because otherwise you end up like we used to when we had our kids on our back, backs hurting, we're arching our back, lower back's not good. So, okay, good good <laughs> point. I just keep hearing people talk about it. It's the thing we all group rucking now. I'm like, yep, yeah, y'all yeah, have fun. <laughs> yes, and, and I'm sure people are. I'm sure they have professional rucking kits now, but I'm sure people are putting more and more weights into their backpacks. I know you just said women should be lifting heavy. Recommend lifting heavy over high reps. Yeah, absolutely. Think about it takes a while for the muscle to the muscle to activate. If the weight is too light, you take a, let's say let's use a number. 20 repetitions until you actually feel using the bicep on the, in your arm to, to feel something. So you need to recruit that muscle tissue to do something. So you have to overload it in order to, to stimulate muscle growth. And if you do not stimulate that muscle growth, you put all the stress into your joints, not what we want. So it has to be, in in my opinion, it has to be a way just using the arm as a simple example. If you do a bicep curl where you curl the hand to the shoulder, and if you say, I can do this with three pounds 20 times, it's too light. I can do this with a five pound 12 times. You're That's a good starting position. That's a, okay, let's see, can you do two or three of those 12 times as called sets? And say, okay, I can do this, then start with this weight. It has to be challenging enough that you recruit the muscle fiber to grow, which is basically through the exercise, you're breaking down the muscle belly or the muscle tissue. It then repairs itself, and that's how we get the muscles. So if it's too light, there's nothing going to happen in your muscle, but you're putting a lot of strain on your on your elbows in this case. That makes sense. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit to intermittent fasting. I know you practice intermittent fasting. If you could just explain what are the benefits and uh, do you do it in combination with any other eating plan? Intermittent fasting in itself is a, is an eating strategy. It's not a diet. You can eat whatever you want with intermittent fasting. There is the only rules is that you are fasting for a certain period of time. You can extend the fast. You can, there's a many options of, of, um, lengths of fasts. You are the benefits of intermittent fasting is because of the process of autophagy, which breaks down cells in your stomach. You will get more energy. Also, the idea from breaking down muscle, uh, I'm sorry, the fat tissue or the fat before it breaks down the muscle tissue, again, enhances the energy of what you need for your, your activities. When you think about that, when we starve ourselves, our body oftentimes, and I use starving on purpose, is the body goes into the lean muscle mass to use that as energy for the body to function, to do our activities. But the goal with intermittent fasting is to have enough food, nutrition, to not have this happen. So we don't starve ourselves. We're eating within the windows that we have established. Again, we're starting with baby steps. The body then uses the uh, fat for energy and leaves the lean muscle uh, mass in place. So that's a, a big benefit for women in midlife. So we're not eating up our lean muscle tissue, but we're going for the, the body fat in that sense. But it needs to be planned a little bit. So it can't just be, hey, I'm going to just not eat for 20 hours and this is going to be the process. It's So it takes steps. The other benefit is that it's easier sometimes to juggle two meals than three. It makes it easier to plan less meal planning. It also, another benefit is that we are, as you start fasting, we are focusing on whole foods, grains. We're focusing on natural foods. We're focusing on plants based eating in a sense, but we're still eating protein. So it could be plant-based, but it could also be chicken or fish. We're looking for our healthy food groups to be the main bulk of our diet, which brings us to mindful eating. So the mindful eating of, you know, do I choose the fried potatoes or do, do uh, the fried, the French fries or use the steamed potato? Either way is good. But 
what do I get for the bang of the buck? If I get a, a steamed potato, it's way healthier and uh, less fats, less unhealthy fats than the French fries are. So the, the, the mindset goes towards eating better, healthier choices in our foods. I talked about the, the simplicity. I talked about autophagy. I talked about fat burning energy because of the process of how we eat and how we nourish in our body is, is huge. And it's, it's easy. It's not a diet. So you can change it up anytime you want to. Uh, you decide how long you want to fast or not for that matter. That's, I think in a nutshell, I think I covered. Yeah. I just, I have a question about that. The breaking down the fat before the muscle happens because it's, it's intermittent. You're not fasting for an extended period of time. Like people who are, don't have food, they do lose muscle. But because you're, you're eating within windows to break your fast encourages your body to consume the fat in your body rather than muscle. Correct. Is that what you said? Yep. That's, that's in essence. So, so it's, it's easy to understand for somebody is like, well, how does it actually hurt? I mean, there's this whole uh, process in the body that breaks the glycogen down. And, and while we're, when we're not eating uh, and uses that, but that's just the whole process. But it's in simplicity is like, oh, I, I haven't eaten. So now my body goes to the, the fat first because I fed it the right, right foods. I think is it the most simplistic way I can think of. All right. I think as women age that you worry about if you're trying to lose weight or whatever, here you are worrying about building muscle. And then we do things that cause our body to consume the muscle. So that's good to know. And it's also when we're, especially when we're finishing our fasting time, it is crucial what we eat as we go back to eating. So instead of saying, I use the French fries as an example, instead of saying, oh, you know, it's lunchtime now, this my fast is over, I eat a French fry, which triggers a d very diff different chemical reaction in the body as far as nutrition is concerned, that as if you were to eat an avocado or a nut butter, that the chemical reaction then in the gut triggers a very different reaction. So if you eat the, the proteins, you prolong your fat burning process uh, as you're giving it protein. If you were to give it the fries, it would, it would spike your, I, I'm going to go there anyways, going to spike your insulin level. So that's when we're thinking insulin levels. That's when the insulin, we want more carbs. So with fasting, we're reducing that insulin spike and or eliminating it to a certain extent that we're not craving the uh, carbs, but we want the protein in order to burn the fat. So it, it's all to do with the insulin levels and how insulin, uh, your body responds to the insulin, the body responds to the foods you feed it with its insulin spikes. Chris and I were talking about intermittent fasting on a recent episode. And I said, I usually, when I have done intermittent fasting, I feel really good doing it. I, it has always worked well for me. But people talk about getting enough protein in. So I quit fasting because I was concerned about eating protein throughout the day. What are your thoughts on that? Do we need to be eating 25 grams of protein all day long? My, my simple solution to that is eat protein with every meal. Okay. So if I'm only eating two meals a day, make sure I'm getting protein in protein both Protein with every meal, right? And make it basically, if you look at your plate, because that can get, it's, it's, it's like with this whole like, the the whole eating thing can get so complicated and overly and overly worrisome. It's like if you think about I have a chicken for lunch and I have some salmon for dinner, you're good to go. And and, and that cuts away this whole like, do I get enough? Did I get enough protein? Should I maybe need more? Do I need more protein? That's to determine by your activity level, how much you weigh, how old you are. There's all these factors can tie in a little bit more specifically, but eat protein with every meal, be done with it and cut down on uh, the quick carbs. You know, think about eating vegetables instead of rice and pasta. So have that and you're good to go because it doesn't have to be that complicated. There is a thought on intermittent fasting when it goes on to hormone balance, but I don't want to get too much into this because there's so much to talk about when we we talk about hormone balance in our ages and intermittent fasting. But 
protein with every meal done. And that's manageable, right? And it's manageable. Yes, that's you're right. Chicken at lunch and salmon at dinner works. When you're doing intermittent fasting on a regular day, that's one thing. But how do you accomplish that when, say, you're traveling or you're visiting someone who doesn't do intermittent fasting or you're working long hours? How, how do you handle that? Boundaries. Boundaries. <laughs> we talked about that earlier. <laughs> Yep. Yep. You got to set boundaries. And I did an episode on that just before uh, around the Christmas time, uh, how to set boundaries with family that uh, doesn't understand that you're intermittent fasting, that you are um, starving yourself or or d- different uh, work schedules. There's, it's, it's different things. With, with people, you can always say, I am not eating right now. I already ate and just be done with it. And but if you are in a different setting, just eat. Just eat or don't eat. Traveling is a great on a plane. You never get good food. So why don't you fast until you get to your destination, which is what I did when we went to the podcast conference. I didn't eat until I got there and I ate on later. So I fasted longer, but I had my water with me. So I was okay until I had a good food source that was what what I wanted to eat. Travel is easy. Family is a little harder. Vacations. Who cares? You're on vacation. If you want to fast, fast. And when we just went on vacation this year to Portugal, sometimes I had breakfast and sometimes I didn't, but it just is. And then you go back. So it's, it's the neat thing about intermittent fasting. It's flexible. You don't have to be doing the same thing all the time unless it works for you. It's not restrictive. That's another benefit. I don't know if I mentioned that. If you fast 12 and then you, for the weekend, you don't fast. Okay, so be it. It always comes down to, it's not the length. It's what do you want from intermittent fasting? What is it? Do you want to have a healthier gut? Do you want to have more energy? Do you want to lose weight? Do you want to lose body fat, which to me would be more important than weight? I was like, I want to be leaner because that makes my metabolism faster. Or do you just feel like you don't care about food and you want to eliminate as many meals as possible? You know, and you just say, yeah, I eat once a day. The OMAD is once a day. So it really fits. How does that work out? If you're going to work out, how do you handle eating once a day or eating later in the day or whatever? You want to uh, eat before you, um, you want to work out before you eat. Ideally, you wait an hour to two before you eat. So you want to keep that. So you're still fasted. You're in a fasted state. Now you're working out. Now your body is using your your fat to fuel your workouts and give you energy instead of what we always say, oh, have your uh, drink with you or have your Gatorade because you're running out of energy. And we now know that's not true for the most part, for, for most people. And so then you prolong in the fat burning process. And then once you hit that eating window, you started out with a fat, a protein to fuel the right sources in your, in your gut in order to get the results you want. And that's just, you know, just play around with the times when this would be best to do that. And when it's not so good and when it's ideal for you, flexibility is, is key. And that's, you know, that's why I, been fasting for like, I think five years now, maybe longer, but it's a process. Did I see that you have a tip sheet on fasting on your website? Yep. The uh, intermittent fasting uh, quick tip or a cheat sheet for women over 50. Is that available to anyone? I mean, it's something that they could get off your website. Yep. Right there. Great. We'll make sure we put a link in our show notes to that. And Also, speaking about your website, I've always admired your recipes and your meal pack offerings. Can you tell us a little bit about them? Like, what is a meal pack? A meal pack includes delicious, easy, simple meals that anybody can make. And we have, we have different, like, uh, low carb, five ingredient meal uh, uh, packs. You also can, um, scan the uh, the barcode to a, a fitness pal so you can automatically add what you make from that recipe into your fitness pal uh you have a meal plan in there so you can say okay monday through sunday this is the meals i i can make and this is how we're going to uh, break it down into the week um what else is in there 
beautiful pictures. Beautiful pictures. <laughs> yes. And it's just something for somebody who doesn't know what to cook all week or d- needs more recipes or needs a almost an, an eating plan. This is what I eat on Monday. And so I don't have to meal plan myself. This is so super helpful for so many. And you can get all the packs all at once or one at a time. And that's, I found this super helpful for so many because I, I initially, I said, I'm not giving out meal plans. You, we teach you meal planning. <laughs> and then I said, all right, let's just make it easy. Easy is the way to go. Here's a meal plan. Cook, cook with it. So there are times in my life when I have thought if someone would just give me the meal plan, I'd be happy to follow it. You know, it's just, <laughs> and there are other times when I'm happily, figuring it all out for myself. But, you know, there's just sometimes you just like to be told what to do. And that's okay, too. And that's why I finally said, you know, why not? If that is what somebody needs, do it. You provide a variety of services that our listeners might be interested in. So you have videos and courses and you have one-on-one coaching. Is that correct? Yep. And I assume you can do that virtually? I mean, someone could be sitting in Colorado and work with you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And you have something called Fasted and Fit Over 50 Jumpstart Program? Jumpstart is for those of us that want to do a little bit Pilates, have never done Pilates, and want to dabble a little bit with intermittent fasting, but not sure if it's right for them. So that's for the complete newbie to both disciplines. That's an independent course that they take on their own. And uh, it's either seven days or however long they want to keep doing it. Now, what about your fearlessly fit club over 50? Who would especially find this helpful? Anybody who needs a a workout. It's like, I don't know what to do today. (laughs) Okay. Go to pick from the menu of abs, legs, Pilates, Weights. There's all kinds of quick, again, quick workouts. They're the, they're all geared towards quick wins. Nothing too long. You can do it. Pick whatever you need and go with it. So if you can't think of anything to do or yourself, or you say, "Oh man, I'm at home. What can I do?" Because none of them are tied to a piece of equipment, which is also neat. So where do we go on the internet to find you and these different programs like your website and social media? Where should people go to follow you? You can follow me and uh, interact with me at Heike Yates, which is H-E-I-K-E-Y-A-T-E-S. And you can, you just Google it or whatever your preferred Google machine is. You can find me on YouTube, on Instagram, on LinkedIn. I'm pretty much everywhere, but you find it under Heike Yates. Also, my podcast, Pursue Your Spark, is all under my business name, which is my name, Heike Yates. And uh, that's where you find all the programs you guys just mentioned. Thank you very much. And you can also listen to one really special episode that I recorded that's on my website. It's Get Unstuck and Thrive. And you can have a a little bit of a taste of it. And you can also download the, the entire 20 minutes. I really put my heart and soul into this this episode to help women in midlife to get unstuck from what's holding them back and to move forward and then thrive as we're going to our second half of life. But you can do that as well on my website and you find it right at the top. Wonderful. What was the name of the episode again? Get Unstuck and Thrive. Oh, it's a great name. And you will not find it on any of our recordings. Okay. So we have to go to the website to find you it. To, to get Excellent. There. Well, Heike, it's been so Good talking with you. Thank you so much for sharing all of this information with us. I'm so glad to see. I mean, I see you since we're on Zoom. I yes. connect with you guys. It's a pleasure being here. And I hope I can help your listeners with a lot of the information that I have. Yeah, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for this great conversation. We'll talk again soon. Sounds great. Bye. 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 Wow, we certainly got a lot of information from Heike. She is so impressive. Oh my gosh, I 
really like the idea of combining Pilates with strength training. Yeah, I sort of gathered we could do yoga as well, but she really likes the Pilates. But what she said about Pilates helping with the bone density in your spine and then the heavy lifting of strength training, helping with the rest of your bones, that was really interesting. I had never heard that before. Yeah. And so much of what we talked about was about mindset. And, you know, I I really liked how a couple of things she said, like perfection goes higher each time. And so trying to eliminate the perfectionistic tendencies that we all seem to have. And also she said something like motivation is a false narrative and that if it's really hard, it's difficult to get started and really to pick something that you really like to do so that something that's more playful, it's so much easier to do to get started. You know, the one thing about when we were talking about mindset that I really liked that really resonated with me was about making a list of things that you love about yourself because, oh boy, it is so easy to go to the negatives right. for ourselves. I mean, oh, I know I say things I would never say to you, Chris, <laughs> to <laughs> say to myself. <laughs> Yeah, we're all hard on ourselves, aren't we? We are. So that is one thing that Heike said, it depends for a lot of things. And that's something we've talked about before, because, you know, what works for me might not work for you. Yes. And if you're listening and you want to share your thoughts on any of the things that Heike said, please post a comment or send us an email. Our website is becomingelly.com. You can also find Becoming Ellie on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter which is now X, Pinterest, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And if you'd like to help us out, please leave a review of the podcast or rating on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Oh, that would be great. Thank you. It was great talking with you today, Chris. I'm looking forward to our next episode of the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast. I am too. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.